Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Coming up, we're going to be interviewing the world's most famous atheist, the scientist Richard Dawkins. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Annie Laurie. And I'm Dan. And as our first guest of the fall season, we are happy and honored to have the famed award winning evolutionary biologist. Richard Dawkins, a professor emeritus from Oxford. Richard Dawkins may be best known for his international blockbuster, The God Delusion. He now has a new book just out th this past month in the United States. It's called Books Do Furnish a Life, Reading and Writing Science. And if you have not been living under a rock for the last 50 years, you know all about Richard Dawkins' influential books, including the Selfish Gene, in which he coined the word meme and which was voted by a Royal Society poll to be the most inspirational, influential science book of all time. He also wrote The Extended Phenotype, The Blind Watchmaker, which was the first one that I read of his books, River Out of Eden, Climbing Mount Improbable, The Ancestor's Tale, The Magic of Reality, and other books, including a two-volume memoir of a life in science. So Richard Dawkins, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Really a pleasure to have you here. Love reading all your books. So uh, we want to talk about your new book in a few minutes, Books Do Furnish a Life. But first, in your memoir, you write that you were raised religious and that now you are an advocate of atheism and a, a critic of creationism. So what happened on the road from Damascus? Well, raised religious is a bit of an exaggeration. I, I wouldn't say I was raised religious in my own family. Like just about everybody in England, I went to a Church of England school, uh, or a school that's, that's uh, uh, subscribed to the Church of England anyway. So we had chapel every Sunday and prayers every day and so on. But I wouldn't call that really raised as a, Christian is sort of, I mean, I, I was confirmed into the Anglican Church at the age of, eight, of 13, rather, um, but it didn't really stay very long, so I was never that devout. Did you believe? Did you pray ever? Did you? I, I read that you used to listen to Elvis Presley sing gospel hymns. Yes, yeah, I, did, did, I did pray, and, and that's true. I, I did pray when around about the time I was confirmed, and I had this little sort of fantasy about God, but... As I say, it didn't didn't last very long. Uh, so what happened? Was it science? Yes, I would say it was science because what was left with me after I pretty much gave up on Christianity was a kind of deism, a kind of feeling that there had to be some kind of creator to explain the complexity of the living world. So when uh, I really understood Darwinism, that really... Um, pulled the rug out from under my remaining deistic beliefs. So why is God a delusion, Richard? For somebody who hasn't read your book yet, which would be very shameful ignorance, huh. why is God a delusion? Well, I think you, you have to really read the book. To, I mean, it's pretty hard to summarize a whole book in, in, in one sentence. Um, 
because there's no evidence for it and there's no reason to believe anything for which there is no evidence there is no more evidence for god or gods or a god or this god or that god or the other god than there is to believe in fairies or unicorns and uh so i mean many people think there is and that to me is usually because they believe there is needed for some kind of creator to explain the complexity especially of life but but um to explain the universe too, but but especially life. And I suppose as an evolutionary biologist, I, when I became disillusioned with that argument, then it became clear to me that it was a delusion. So it's one thing to not believe in God. There's a whole lot of people that just, you know, don't believe or don't care. But you are an outspoken advocate, and, and you've written that atheism is something we should be proud of. We should not be apologetic. We should we should be trumpeting this. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are too many people who are sort of indifferent to it and say, well, oh, you know, anything goes. If you want to believe in God, that's fine. Um, I, I think my main reason for objecting to it is that as a scientist, I, I love the scientific explanation for everything. I love the fact that we are close to an understanding of everything we haven't got there yet, but we're, we're a lot further on than we were centuries ago, close to an understanding of everything through the scientific method. And that's so beautiful, that's so wonderful, that to be fobbed off with a half-baked, um, rather silly alternative, which is not an alternative at all, which does not explain anything, is just tragic, especially for children, when it is such a, a, an exciting fact that we can explain things, we can explain life. And that's so exciting that to paper that over with a pseudo explanation, a false explanation of a divine intelligence, a divine creator, is just so sad. And that's my main objection to it. You've talked a lot about uh, the harm of claiming that children are born into a religion. And then, uh, you know, that I have a Protestant child or a Catholic child and some of the problems with religiously segregated education in, in the UK. Why is that such a problem? Yes, I, I, I think it's, in, one of the ways to put it is, is to say, imagine that a child was labeled a Marxist child or an existentialist child or a logical positivist child or a, a Keynesian child or a, or a Hayekian child because their parents were everybody would ridicule that idea. You do not label a child by the views of their parents, by the opinions of their parents. And yet it, religion is the one exception to that. Religion is the one place where children are automatically assumed to subscribe to the opinions of their parents where religion is concerned. And hence people talk about a Catholic child or a Protestant child or a Methodist child or a Muslim child. And that I think is wicked, to, to tie a label around the neck of a child who is too young to know what they think. Or a, a country western music child, or a jazz child, or a hip hop child, yes. you know, because the parents yeah. like this music, the kids ha automatically have to like the same music, which... That's we, right, exactly. We, that, yeah. do, that doesn't always work out that way, does it? Uh, back in the 70s, you coined the word meme in the selfish gene. Uh, did you ever think it would take off like that? And did you ever imagine the word meme would be used today like it's being used on computers, that word? Well, it's a bit disappointing to be misused like that. I mean, it is it is the the using it to to mean a picture with capital letters on it mm. um, is a travesty because it's a it, it's a tiny subset of what a meme is. A, me, a meme is a cultural analog to a gene in a Darwinian context, and it may not be there may not really be a Darwinian context, but if there is, if there is natural selection in favour of ideas or tunes or, or clothes fashions or um, ways of walking or, or anything that is imitated, that by definition is a, is a meme. Whether it's a useful concept depends upon whether there's some kind of natural selection in favor of it. There probably is, at least in some cases, if, if you think about a, a, a tune that people hear somebody singing in the street and then copy it, imitate it, because it gets, they get it on the brain, say, that would be a good example of a meme which probably does have selective value in the Darwinian sense, in the sense that it gets repeated. And good tunes get repeated, whereas bad tunes don't get repeated. Now that is 
a Darwinian effect, a pretty trivial one, but it is a Darwinian effect, that would be a good example of a meme. Well, on the internet, and the internet is a fine ecosystem for memes, and and those that spread, spread because they have spreadable value. That is a genuinely Darwinian effect. If, if it's a selective effect whereby some memes get spread more than others, uh, then that, that is genuinely Darwinian. That is genuinely a meme, yes. Yeah. So memes can also mutate, I guess. It's just like any other type of evolutionary process. Yes, yeah. well, that that be even more. That'd be even better if they mutate. Then the Darwinian analogy is even closer. Uh, so, at the Freedom from Religion Foundation during this pandemic, which was, I guess, uh, we're survival of the fittest, aren't we? We survived by wearing masks. We we have a, a best-selling mask for us that says "In Science I Trust." And a lot of our members around the world have been buying that and they were wearing it instead of in God or in, or in prayer because people were praying for the pandemic to end and look what happened. Prayer didn't work. Why do you think there is such a big science denial in our culture, especially in the United States? Why, why are there so many people just unwilling to even look at the science? Well, you're asking me a question about politics and sociology and social psychology, which is not my field. And so I'm, I can only answer as a a citizen who, who observes the scene like anybody else does. Um, I suppose my impression is that it's been politicized, especially in America, uh, taking precautions about the pandemic, wearing a mask or getting vaccinated has become identified with um, the left and opposition to it has become identified with the right. And so there's a kind of tribalism. This would be my interpretation. I say it's a non-expert one. But tribalism is a very strong force, and this has become tribal. Uh, people tend to, there's, I think there's pretty good evidence that people tend to believe what their, whatever their tribe believes, whatever their cultural tribe believes. And in America, the right-wing tribe, for some reason, has taken it upon itself not to believe in taking precautions about this particular uh, epidemic, this particular mm -hmm. pandemic. That's not true of anything else. I mean, they don't... They don't um, despise people who take precautions against getting cancer and going to get checked up and, and things like that. But in this particular case, they do. And I think it's just something that spread, perhaps you could think of it as a meme, really, as a, as a thing that spread because other members of the tribe spread it, influences um, people who are looked up to and admired by that tribe, by the right-wing tribe, have gone on television, gone on the social media to advertise the idea that wearing a mask is somehow sort of sissy. Hmm. Um, so maybe it's something to do with that. Well, here we have, oh, such a debt to science for the vaccines. And then to see the science denial is really dismaying. I think it's amazing the, the, the achievement of the yes. people who've produced vaccines in such a short time. Yes. I mean, it is astonishing what they've done. I think it, I mean, this really ought to raise the prestige of science no end. So we're going to take a break, Richard, and then when we come back, we want to talk about your new book, which is just out in early September in the United States, Books Do Furnish a Life. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Gabrielle Hanahara, um, and I'm an atheist because I believe in the power of doing good for the sake of doing good and not because some divine entity tells you what is good and what's not, um, and not because you think it will get you into some sort of heavenly afterlife. Uh, I believe in human morality, um, which is why I think that most cultures across the world have come to the kind of same basic principles and values, such as the golden rule, which isn't based in religion, but is based in 
human interactions um, and mutual respect. And I think a lot of people turn to religion because it makes the choice of morality really easy, black and white, right and wrong, and you don't have to decide which is which. And in my experiences being an atheist through my life, I've found that uh, moral choices are something that I think about a lot more than a lot of other people because nobody's telling me the answer. Um, and since I don't believe in an afterlife, pretty much my whole meaning in life is based on that I can leave this world a better place by my actions. And welcome back. I'm Dan Barker with Annie Laurie Gaylor, and we're continuing our conversation with the famed scientist and author, Richard Dawkins. So Richard, you have a new book, Books Do Furnish a Life. Tell us a little bit more about that. A few years ago, I wrote a book called Science in the Soul, which was a collection of my sort of miscellaneous essays over the years. And that collection was edited by Gillian Summerscales with me. And we realized that that had grown too big. So we needed to split it into two volumes. And the best way to split it would be in some kind of thematic way. So we decided to split it with everything to do with books was going to go in the second volume, which is this one. So a lot of my incidental writings happen to be forewords to books or book reviews or essays about books. And so that's the one, that's the collection that's, that's brought together in Books to Furnish a Life. Well, I love this, Richard, because it's bite size. A lot of your other books are magnum opuses. They're just beautiful, broad studies of science and evolution. But here are these nuggets that we can read about, uh, really about other books. And uh, what you did in this book was you introduced each of the six sections with a transcribed interview. You have uh, Steven Pinker's one. Um, Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens is another. And you, didn't you interview him shortly before he died? Yes, that's right. This, this one is rather unique uh, because uh, the audio book has the complete interview. It's not just a abridged version ah. of the interview, which is all the others are. I think it was the last interview he gave before he died, actually. Um, and that was just before he was given the Richard Dawkins Award at the um, at the Free Thought Convention, I forget what it was in Texas. In Houston, was, yes. In, in Houston, that's right. Because that's where he was in hospital, not hospital. Mm -hmm. That was where he was visiting the hospital to get special cancer treatment. Um, so I interviewed him the day before that, at the house that he'd been lent, and it was a wonderful occasion. We had dinner afterwards. He was too ill to actually eat much of the dinner, but his, his sparkling conversation, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. um, I recorded it on my iPhone, so the recording quality is not great, but um, it was good enough to be transcribed for the new Statesman. Um, I was at guest editing the Christmas issue of the New Statesman magazine in England, and uh, that's where it was first printed. And that's the version that's printed in Books to Furnish a Life. But the audio book, Books to Furnish a Life, has the entire interview. Huh. Um, the quality is not great because, as I say, it was done on an iPhone without any professional engineer supervising it. Uh, but I think it was worth it for the historic interest. This was the last interview he gave. Kind of uh, a Last it, Supper. A Last Supper? Yes. Huh. Indeed, yes. Boy, what a, what a brilliant mind, too. And, and you do point out in your interview that uh, you didn't necessarily agree with everything he said uh, on some of those issues. No, that's I mean, th we we didn't disagree about much. I mean, I think he he took a different line on abortion than I would, and probably mm -hmm. you would as well. Um, I'm not quite sure why he was so squeamish about abortion, but he was. Um, we didn't talk about that, no. um, and we disagreed about Iraq. Um, I, I mean, he's more hawkish than I was or am. Um, and to be fair to him, he actually had experience. He'd been there, which most of us haven't, yeah. and his had this sort of intrepid bravery, he would venture to trouble spots the world over throughout his journalistic career. So he knew what he was talking about where war was concerned, which I certainly don't, not personally. Um, those are the kind of things we disagreed about, but those didn't really come up in, in that interview. In the Four Horsemen discussion between me and him and Sam Harris and Dan Dennett, a disagreement arose there where he, where Christopher didn't want religion to die away, mainly because he likes arguing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, 
he was quite, uh, quite, quite a debater. Now, um, in terms of forwards that you did for some of these books, there are two that are of special interest to me and Dan because you did so generously forwards for two of Dan's books, uh, Godless oh, right. and, uh, uh, and God, God the Most, the most unpleasant, unpleasant Character, character. Which, which was really defending you, your mm -hmm. statement about the unpleasantness of yes. the God of the Bible. But Dan, yes, uh, there's, yeah. a, there's a line that Richard used about you that's very memorable. Do you want to repeat that? I always get a laugh, Richard. Sometimes I read from that forward where you say, it sounds like a compliment, you say, Dan Barker is the most eloquent witness of internal delusion that I know. <laughs> and the audience always laughs. Uh, but that, your whole section is about um, delusion and skepticism that you're talking about in this book, right? Yes, I think I also quoted, maybe I got it from you, you're the kind of ev evangelist, you were the kind of evangelist you didn't want to sit on a bus with. Yeah. Wasn't that, was that your life? That's me, yeah. yeah. You, would, you would not have liked me very much, uh, Richard. <laughs> of course, I wish I had had the good fortune to sit next to you on a bus back then. But <laughs> I think Christ Christopher would have liked you because he would have enjoyed arguing yeah, with you. Yes. Uh, so... Um, and one of the things I like about these nuggets in your book is you include some reviews, critical reviews. You review a creationist book, and your writing in there is just it's, it's, uh, quite incisive, I guess I would say. It's really fun to read how you pick apart some of these people that you disagree fun with. To write. Still going after the yes. creationists. Y yes. Um, th that one, I think, yes, I, that, that one is particularly sarcastic. Huh one. Huh. There are a couple of negative ones there as well. One called Porno Philosophy, I think. Huh. Um, uh, there may be one. Oh, yes, the, the, the Stephen Rose, um, yeah. Richard Lewent, uh, what, that, that one, yes, that's negative as well. So what did you talk with uh, Stephen Pinker about in this book? Oh, gosh. Um, everything, really. Um, we we th There's a case where we dis don't disagree about anything, I think. So we, So and there are people who think that that means that it doesn't make for a good conversation, but I think it, it can do. I think of it as a kind of mutual tutorial, but in this case, I have more to learn from him than the other way around. So um, I think I was learning from him a lot. I was learning from him about linguistics, about psychology. Um, I take the opportunity when I meet somebody like that of really trying to to learn from them, to, to understand things that I don't understand, which they can explain. He's a brilliant explainer, as you know. Uh, um, that was, I think that originally was done for television. I think it was done for um, a, a Channel 4 program in Britain. Mm -hmm. and, and I traveled to Harvard to interview him. Well, he has two of my favorite books of all time, The Language Instinct and The Blank Slate. I think those are just, just genius works. Uh. All his books are brilliant yeah. and, and, and versatile. They're all about different things, and yet he seems to be come across as a major authority on each subject mm -hmm. he touches. He has an entire book based on exceptions to the past tense in irregular verbs. A whole book about that, which is a fun read. <laughs> <laughs> you also spoke with Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, astrophysicist. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I enjoyed that very much. I and mean, he's a lovely person to talk to. He's, he's so friendly and so witty and so funny. Um, and um, you, you have a wonderful conversation with him. You feel you're really getting somewhere when you talk to him. I, I thoroughly enjoy talking to him. Hmm. And I hope it comes across in the transcript. I, th I think it does. So before the show today, I was telling our sound guy that Richard Dawkins has a new book. And he says, well, you can always say that, <laughs> Richard Dawkins. Do you have another, <laughs> do you have another project? <laughs> <laughs> you have another project in the works? Yes, uh, it's called Flights of Fancy, uh, and it's coming out in November, and it's jointly with Jana Lentsova, um, who's the artist illustrating it. And it's about flight. It's about flying in animals, uh, that's to say insects, pterosaurs, birds and bats, yeah. and in humans, and especially the sort of Leonardo da Vinci's fanciful mm. flying des designs and 18th century balloonists and things like that, as well as modern aircraft. So it's animal aircraft and human aircraft. Well, let's hope this book takes off then. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you for that. So we only have two minutes left here. Um, 
And I just want to talk briefly about the clergy project. You were largely instrumental in getting the clergy project off the ground. And you and I talked, and Daniel Dennett, of course, the philosopher, got the thing. It's now 10 years old. It has more than 1,000. Can you briefly explain what it is and then why you are so interested in the clergy who have lost their faith? Yes, um, well, I, I came across this, as you say, about 10 years ago, and the idea that, that there are clergy who've lost their faith, and I felt very sympathetic towards them. I think possibly you were one of the first that I thought about, and and um, you didn't need it, but you didn't need the help, but I, I thought that you might have colleagues who uh, needed, um, well, needed a job, actually, because because if you've lost your livelihood as a clergyman, clergy person, um, what do you do? You, 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 you found your niche, which was wonderful, but others don't. And so I was thinking of things like getting, raising money to give them um, re-education or training for a new job as a carpenter or something like that. Yeah. Um, but we, we soon became clear that there was not going to be enough money for that. And so I think in discussion with you and, and Dan Dennett, we realized that uh, it would have to be something much cheaper than that, and setting up a website uh, where clergy people who've lost their faith could get together confidentially uh, so they didn't get outed, which was very important because if they got outed to their congregations, they might lose their jobs or lose their livelihood, lose their respect in the community. Uh, and uh, but so some, somewhere where they could go to talk to each other, confide in each other, and I think originally it was my foundation that set up that website. That's right, yeah, and you were very generous in paying for that to get that off the ground. Well, we're out of time. Right. We're out of time, Richard. I wish we could talk for another hour about all of this. But we're talking with evolutionary biologist and author Richard Dawkins, whose new book, which is just out in the United States this September, is called Books Do Furnish a Life, Reading and Writing science. So thank you so much for joining us today, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Session. Thank you for everything, Richard. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.